resume recording. Okay, good, good evening everyone from the Parsippany Library or my home, whichever you would like to call it. Um, this evening we're doing, uh, we're doing New Jersey Geology and Rivers with Brian. He's our co-host. Um, a couple little Zoom etiquette. Please put yourself on mute or I will mute you. Um, only because if you have any questions, you can put them in the chat box uh, or you can wait. I, I think Brian's gonna have plenty of time for Q&A. We don't have to close the meeting early like we did last time. So there'll be plenty of time. Um, if, and um, I think that's it. Any other questions on that, Brian? I think we're all set, right? We're good. Okay. So take it away. Awesome. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Brian Pink, and I am an AmeriCorps New Jersey Watershed Ambassador. I'll explain a little bit more about that in a moment when I share my presentation. Um, I do want to just ask, though, should anyone here have a background in geology? No, maybe. Yes, no. Okay, cool. Doesn't look like we do. Um, if anyone does or is watching this at a later point, I just want to say I have a, bat a bachelor's degree in geology from Lafayette College, and I put this together to be sort of an intro um, kind of overview for people who maybe don't have that knowledge. There are some simplifications, and I apologize if you were if you feel that I, you know, maybe misrepresented something. I'm always happy to take any emails and discuss. With that, I will share my presentation. All right, cool. So real quick, um, I am here on behalf of the Persephone Green team. They did ask me just to say a quick um, little summary about them. The Green team is a great organization in Persephone trying to help make, I guess, Persephone more green um, in a myri myriad of ways. The current big push is to um, improve your town score in the Sustainable Jersey point. Sustainable Jersey is a municipal statewide, um, I guess, program where you basically take action to improve the environmental uh, sustainability of your town. You get um, different certification levels, bronze, silver, uh, gold, and I think gold is the highest. And only two towns in the state have gold. Persephone is trying to become one of the next ones. Uh, with that, I will switch over to my presentation. And yeah, so New Jersey Geology and Rivers. I'm Brian Pink. I am a New Jersey Watershed Ambassador. Real quick, for those of you who don't know what AmeriCorps is, it is a federally funded program similar to Peace Corps, which sends young adults like myself to other countries to do service projects, but AmeriCorps is domestic, the federally funded service program, um, state nationwide, and my program is the New Jersey Watershed Ambassador Program. Um, local to New Jersey, there are 20 watershed ambassadors, one for each watershed management area. And we work in conjunction with the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. If you're confused about what a watershed is, don't worry, I will explain that in a hot second. Um, my background is that I graduated from Lafayette College in May 2019 with a degree in geology and a minor in environmental science. And I started this program in September 2019, this is my second term, after serving in Reno, Nevada for the Bureau of Land Management for a summer. With that, let's take it away. We have um, 55 minutes. I can easily make this presentation last two hours. So we have a few things competing here. I want to try to get through all the information, but I will also have to speak a bit quicker and abbreviated which might make it confusing. So if you do have questions, please speak up. Um, but we are trying to, you know, stay on time. 
So what is a watershed? A watershed is an area of land that drains into a body of water, such as a river, lake, or stream, or bay. And it's defined by the regional topography of the area. So right here, I have a kind of scale diagram of a watershed. And what you see is that if it were to rain or snow precipitation, anything that falls within this area of land is going to flow downhill into this river and eventually make it down to the large river below. Um, the entire area of land is one watershed and everything within it is within that watershed. That includes the forest, the farm, the city, the suburbia, the factory, the dam, the wetlands, and everything in between, as well as the groundwater. The groundwater is part of the watershed too. Now, within this larger watershed, we have smaller watersheds, right? If some water falls over here, it's gonna make it to the smaller tributary before joining up with the larger river. Whereas if the water were to fall over here, it'll go to that tributary and then join up with the larger river. If water were to fall on the other side of this regional topographic elevation divide, well, that's just in a different watershed. And perhaps that watershed would eventually meet up with this river and make an even larger river basin or watershed. In New Jersey, we have 20 watershed management areas, which are made up of one or several watersheds. And we in Parsippany are based in watershed area management area number six. You can see where we are right here. And our watershed management area is made up of three different large watersheds, the Upper Passaic, the Whippany, and the Rockaway River watershed basin. Parsippany actually straddles the divide between the Whippany and the Rockaway. And you can see it right here. We have the Rockaway, the Whippany, and Upper Passaic. You guys are right here by the large Lake Reservoir. Now to finally get into some of that geology, I have a little um, activity. Now, if, if I were with you guys in person, at this point, I would take out a large USGS topographic map, lay it on the floor and have you all come up to the front of the room and kind of pour over the contours with me. Unfortunately, we cannot do that. So I've created sort of an approximation of that. Now, I was telling um, you a little bit earlier, this will not be nearly as participation heavy as my last presentation, um, but this is one of the few times I am asking for some participation. What we see here is our watershed management area, Persephone is you know, roughly over here. And I think it's pretty clear that we have some differences in color, the amount of um, you know, roughness in the area between up here and down there, and even some differences in terms of um, you know, what this might be up here versus down here. So I want you just to just take a moment, look it over, and then I'm just gonna ask for any observation you might have. All right, great. Um, anyone, uh, feel free to put in the chat. There are some observations. Yeah, um, about the elevations, um, the terrain. And right, you notice some differences in yeah. elevation and terrain. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly mm -hmm. right. It looks a bit, a bit like there's some more ridges and elevation up here, where it's yeah. a bit flatter. Anything else? Yeah. I think the amount of forest, I think, further up. Is that what that is, the green? The green is Yeah, the forest. green is forest, whereas yeah. the gray is really just, um, well, marshland, but also urbanization. A lot more forest up here than down here. Nice. Vegetation. Nice. Do you have any other observation? Um, anyone who wishes uh, to make an ob observation can certainly unmute themselves if they would like. Um, the uh, gray area at one one time back in the uh, ice ages be one big lake. Right. So 
you are right. There was glaciers involved in this landscape. Um, this was not one big lake, um, but the landscape you see is very much a product of glaciers. And what you see up in the north is also very much a product of glaciers. We see these lakes, there's a lot more lakes up in the north, whereas down in the south, we do not have lakes. And that is directly due to our glaciers. Um, the last thing, the last kind of observation that is a bit harder to catch on to is that we have sort of a lineation, a trend in the directions of what we see. All of these ridges and lakes are pointing in that northeast, southwest direction, right? Nothing's really crisscrossing in that other way. Um, and then obviously down here, it's a bit more haphazard. But up here, you see that lineation greatly. Hmm. So that, um, those are the four observations, elevation, northeast, southwest trend, lots of lakes, and lots of vegetation. Now, we can explain this all with geology. And the, you know, the cusp of what I want to get through tonight is explaining all the different geology we see in New Jersey, relating it to our rivers, and then relating it, you know, a bit more locally to you. You see all different kinds of geographic bedrock type here, and then we see different um, different hydrographic hydrographic provinces as well. And that can be explained with geology. So really brief intro, um, take you back to sixth grade earth science. Right in front of us, we have the rock cycle. And um, really simply, there are three major types of rock, igneous rock, sedimentary rock, and metamorphic rock. Generally, igneous rock are going to be your hot lava and magma, it erupts, we, and then it touches the cold air and cools, eventually crystallizing into a hard rock that we call igneous rock. Um, then that hard igneous rock might then break down through weathering and erosion before being deposited and sitting there and lithifying into what we call a sedimentary rock. It's just all the little bits of sediment lithified and cemented into a new rock. The metamorphic rock would be either an igneous rock or a sedimentary rock that's been um, kind of buried under everything else and has undergone high heat and pressure, recrystallizing it and making it into a brand new rock. And you'll note that the arrows are going in all different kinds of directions. Igneous rock can be sedimentary, become sedimentary or, or metamorphic, and metamorphic can become sedimentary as well. Just to give you a little sense of what igneous rocks look like, they come in all different shapes and sizes and colors. We see um, all these different crystals and minerals throughout kind of interlocking into one hardy thing. It's really hard to erode igneous rock, usually. There are some exceptions. Then we have the metamorphic rock. You can see that there's a lot of this banding. All of these similar colors land up together. And that's because when we apply that heat and pressure, we actually kind of start to melt the rock again. And then we get stratification of the minerals, which provide those colors. And then we have sedimentary rocks that come as well in all different shapes, sizes, and colors. And the different patterns you see are due to the different depositional environments where that sediment is laid to rest. You have really fine grain sediment and really coarse grain conglomerate as well. Now, the next kind of basic geologic idea I want to get across is the idea of plate tectonics. Oops, sorry, buddy. That um, there we go. Um, so we have our plate tectonic, and basically what's happening is the entire um, surface of the Earth is made up of our continental crust. I like to think of this as sort of your, your cracker, almost, a puzzle, jigsaw puzzle, on top of a jelly 
below. And all of those jigsaw puzzles and crackers are sliding around on top of that jelly. Um, and they move in three main different directions. They move into each other, which is what we call a convergent boundary when they actually collide, show you some paper, they collide and push things up. We have um, transform boundaries, which are when two of those puzzle pieces actually slide past each other. And I don't know if you can hear it, but you can hear some of that friction and heat. We get earthquake with those transform boundaries. Then we have divergent boundaries, where those plates actually go away from each other. And what that means is that we create space for that jelly to actually rise up and cool and form new crust. And here I have a picture of the plate tectonic, a video actually, of plate tectonics moving around, starting 1,000 million years ago, all the way to present day. And as we watch it, I want you to note that right now, where we start, none of this looks like the globe that we know and love today. Um, and some of these land masses travel from the equator all the way down to the South Pole and back up to the equator again. They really travel the entire gamut of the globe. They move away from each other. They move towards each other. And as we move closer and closer to now, we see them come together into our Pangea, the Pangea that probably so many of you have heard before, before separating again into the globe we have today, right? So you can see that all of those land masses have collided and diverged and transformed, um, you know, a lot of times before over the past 1,000 million years. And that has had a profound impact on the landscape that we see today. Um, and so New Jersey, which is on the eastern seaboard of the United States, or North America, the uh, continent, has undergone a bunch of different um, collisional and divergent um, histories, giving rise to the um, multiple physiographic provinces that we see today. We have the Valley and Ridge, the Highlands, the Piedmont, and the Coastal Plains. Each one of those different provinces have different underlying geology, which we can see up in the Valley and Ridge. We have carbonates and sandstone. Then we move into the Highlands. We have that pink Precambrian metam metamorphic basement rock. Before we move into the Piedmont Plain, which is made up of more of a sedimentary um, rock, and then finally into the coastal plain, which is pretty much all sand. And then along with those different geologies, we have different elevational regimes, which you can see in the visual elevation map to the, in the middle here. Now, I'm going to give you a sort of a run through of New Jersey. Um, Depositional and original geologic history. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So 600 million years ago, the Cambrian to Devonian ages, the state of New Jersey was essentially at the equator. And it was completely underwater or covered with a beach. This is what you would have found. Tropical paradise, um, coral, dune, and beach everywhere across the entire state of New Jersey. And the geology, the underlying geology was relatively flat. It was just a lot of deposition because in that ocean you have sand that's constantly being deposited. And you can see that all of those layers are flat on top of each other, layering up. You have some, you know, delta river deposit tying stuff out to the sea, but this is basically what it looked like. And that was, again, 600 million years ago. Then over the past 550 to 250 million years ago, we had three um, island arc collisions or, um, or, or mountain orogenies. Orogenies are mountain building events. 
And what that means is that we actually had large islands collide into the eastern seaboard. I want you, I want to direct you to the to the left side of my screen, and you can see one of those collisions happen. You see that volcanic island arc collide into um, essentially New Jersey on the left. And at the beginning, we have that still pretty flat area with some deposition still happening. But over time, we start to see some changes in that rock until on the bottom, you see a much higher elevation because we crumpled New Jersey and pushed it upward like this. And we see the what were once flat layers are folded and faulted. Now those island arcs collided into New Jersey at a northwest um, southeast angle, the direction of my arrow. That's northwest southeast. And that's really important because um, imagine you have some Play-Doh in your hand in a ball and you start to press it and squeeze it flat. What you're gonna find is that that Play-Doh is going to flat outward, right? In the opposite direction of how you squeeze it. So you're gonna push inward and then Play-Doh is going to go outward. What, that, what I'm trying to tell you is that we push inwards in the northeast southwest direction and all of these rocks fold and fault in the northeast southwest direction, just like with our Play-Doh. It squeezes outward, it squeezes up and it squeezes out. What I have going on on the right side is sort of the diagram of um, our flat beach with our flat layers. And then over time, we have more deposition, more deposition, more deposition. And then those three different erogenies occur. And what was once flat becomes folded and faulted and uplifted. And what you can see is that we have some layers that were at the very bottom, suddenly at the top, right? We have stuff that was at the bottom, that pre-Cambrian metamorphic rock, suddenly uplifted to the top of our layer. And how that happened is kind of complicated. I will try to explain a little bit to you, but for purposes today, as long as we agree that we happen, that that happened, it will make life a lot easier. And what that means is that in New Jersey, or just west of New Jersey, we created the Appalachian Mountains. The Appalachian Mountains, once upon a time, were as high as the Himalayas. We had the entire mountain range higher than Mount Everest. What we see today is just a sad remnant of what was once a glorious range. Um, then about 280 million years ago to 230 million years ago, we had our breakup of Pangaea, right? So we had a bunch of different convergent tectonic margins occur, mountain building, mountain building, mountain building. Now we have divergent margin. We're breaking it up and we're allowing some of that jelly to rise. I'll show you the video really quick. Um, Pangaea, it breaks up and you can see Africa separating from North America and then everything settles in its present day. I'll play that again for you. Not how it happened over the past, you know, few hundred million years. Now, when we have that divergence happening, we don't just have, you know, a clean break and a rise of, of jelly or magma. We actually get what we call normal fault. The crust breaks down and kind of falls into the void spaces in a few different locations. And what we ended up with is two main basins that were breaking up. If we look at the, um, the ocean, I'll, I'll play the video again. If we look at the Atlantic Ocean between North America and Europe, we have, this is actually a huge basin that formed from a normal fault. Um, and we can see that it filled in the active rift system with the early Atlantic Ocean. There was another rift system that did develop before dying out. And that played a huge role in what we have ge 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 geological, yeah, 
geologically in New Jersey. When we create those spaces, as I said, we do allow some of that jelly or lava to rise to the surface. And so we'll end up with magmatism in New Jersey as well. Um, and you can see kind of the breaking up growing basins and then the larger basins 150 million years ago. Um, did that make sense to everyone? I just want to kind of put a nod of head, maybe. Yeah, cool. Um, so then finally, 18,000 years ago, so we're no longer on the 100 million years, we're on 18,000 years ago, we had the glass glacial maximum. Now, this is a picture of San Joseph Glacier in New Zealand. Um, it's a picture I took, I threw it up on the screen, but we had glaciers just like this in New Jersey. Um, and what this means is that we had ice coming to North Jersey um, and eroding the uplands of the state, leaving behind large U-shaped glacial valleys and depositing that sediment further south below. And then finally, and to present day, we have rivers. Again, just a picture I love, again, from New Zealand. We don't actually have rivers like this in New Jersey, but we would have when the, Appal when the Appalachian were as high as the Himalayas. We would have had these huge bridge rivers carrying that sediment down into the Piedmont plain of the state and out to the Atlantic Ocean. And so that's sort of like your really crash course geological history of the state. But I know you're still sort of looking at my four provinces and saying, I still don't understand why we have New Jersey looking the way it does. And that's OK. You're exactly where I want you to be. We're going to jump into that. In New Jersey, we have four of the geographic provinces, the Valley and Ridge, Highlands, Piedmont, and Coastal Plains. Let's start with the Valley and Ridge. What we can see here on our map to the right is that the Valley and Ridge is made up of this blue color and the purple color, and maybe even a little bit of this lighter green. Now, that dark blue to the very west is a conglomerate sandstone and has some shell and limestone as well. And then we move into that purple, which is again, conglomerate sandstone, shell, and limestone. Now, it was, what I want to make clear to you is that the conglomerate, the sandstones, and the shells, those are hard sedimentary rocks. It's hard to erode that. Your limestone is made up of calcium carbonate. You can erode that with chemical weathering, acid rain. It's just like um, the, the limestone food that you can break up. The, the hard water that you have is due to that broken up calcium carbonate. And so we have two different differential erosional abilities of our bedrock, and that is really key. Um, so let's think about it. You have the Appalachian Mountains. They're huge. They make up that northwestern part of New Jersey. And they're once as high as the Himalayas, made up of that car carbonate, which was once upon a time the coral reef. Because remember, New Jersey was once upon a time a tropical paradise. So we find carbonate from the coral up in the mountain, as well as the sandstone from deposited sediment. It was originally flat. We had our um, convergent margin uplift those mountains, fold it all about. And what that means is we get folding. And in some places, we have our sandstones, and other places we have our carbonate. And what we're left with is within those folds, we have some areas of those sandstones and other areas of carbonate. That carbonate is easier to erode, and that makes our valleys. The harder to erode sandstone stands up to this day as our hills, not quite our Appalachian Mountains are still a little bit more west of where we are today, but within our Valley and Ridge Province, we have our higher areas and lower areas, our sandstone, hard to erode, and carbonate, easy to erode. 
And here's one of the clearest examples of that. Mount Tammany in the Kitney Mountains in the Delaware Water Gap. Mount Tammany is made up of sandstone, a pillar standing above everything else. And then we have the river, the Delaware River, right next to it, cutting through our carbonate rock below, our ridge and our valley. So that explains our valley and ridge. Now we'll jump into our highlands. If we take a look at our highland map on the right, we'll see that it's mostly all made up of that pink color. That pink is nice and granite, or what I call your Precambrian metamorphic basement rock. Um, I have a question, is Mount Tammany part of an instant arc? Um, yeah, so what it, so um, Mount Tammany is part of the larger, I guess, uplift mountains that we received. We have the Appalachian Mountains, and then um, just to the east, we're going to have some lower mountains as well as we kind of drift off from the main collisional regime. Um, but what we see of Mount Tammany is also a shadow of what, what it once was, been really eroded down. Um, yeah, so the highlands are in pink, made up of marble, knife, and granite what I call the Precambrian metamorphic basement rock. Um, and I say basement for a reason. That rock is way below everything else. Um, yeah, way below everything else. You think about our flat deposition layers and then the stuff on the very bottom. And somehow we have it at the very top on the surface. That's due to our divergent, um, divergent tectonic margins that we had. We, remember I told you we had the drop, dropping down blocks, the horse and grabbing, the normal fault. What that means is that some of the rocks that maybe is here, this drops down and it actually exposes what's there. And then over here, um, that higher rock, that newer rock drops down, which means it's getting eroded more easily by our um, ocean kind of eating away. But then we also had that folding, bringing some of that basement rock to the surface, making it more accessible. And this is what I mean by that. When we had our normal fault, some of that higher, newer rock kind of dropped away and exposed some of that metamorphic basement rock that was below. And that was the highly pressurized metamorphic rock. Um, then we had the glaciers kind of erode away any of that um, superficial sediment that may have been there and carve into our metamorphic rock. And as I said, when we have glaciers, we scour into it, we carve out great glacial valleys, as well as create lots of scourings and lakes. So this is an example of a glacially carved landscape of North Jersey. This is Wyanoke Point in Northern Green State Forest, um, right up in Ringwood, New Jersey. And this entire overlook is made up of your Precambrian granite, knife, and marble. Now, um, and the valley is largely carved out by glaciers. Now, if I had a better picture of something from here, what we would see are striations. This is not from that specific spot. It's actually from, um, again, Kittatinny Valley State Park. But this would be at um, Dorving Green Overlook as well. And what we see are these striations. This is your metamorphic um, granite rock with, and the glaciers took other rocks and scraped that bedrock over as it moved past, leaving these scours in the landscape in the direction of movement. And so what I was trying to get at, tell you earlier when we were going over our topographic um, activity is that in the highland, and this is in fact the highland, we are perfectly divided here. We have the highland here and then a different geographic province below. This highland is made up of that metamorphic basement rock. And the, um, we have that tecton tectonic collision, which pushed things in that northeast southwest trend. And then the glaciers came through and carved it. They, they came through specifically 
at the weak point along that northeast southwest trend, eroded out in that direction and carved out the awake as well. And then because it's metamorphic rock, this area is much, much more difficult to erode than sedimentary rocks. And we have the highlands because metamorphic rock is really difficult to erode. So the elevations here are a lot higher overall. Um, next, we move into the Piedmont Plain. Um, Piedmont Plain would give the idea that it's flat. And well, for the most part, it is. Although I think you would agree with me that we do see some ridges within that green area. And so when we look over at our geologic map, what we find is that the Piedmont Plains are made up of a few different layers. We have the pale kind of green, which is made up of soapstone, shale, sandstone, conglomerate. Then we have this darker green, which is sand, silt, and clay. All sedimentary rock, all sort of in that in-between hard tree road style. Um, but then we have this brown layer. And this brown layer is actually basalt or igneous rock. And that igneous rock is actually forming these ridges, the really prominent ridges that we see. Because igneous rock is crystalline. It's harder to erode than that sedimentary rock. Now, why do we have that igneous rock? Well, if you remember our breakup of Pangaea, we broke up that face, created space um, here. You can see the normal fault developing, and we opened that space for the magma to rise to the surface. That magma went right into our new earth basin, which is where the Piedmont Plains are. Um, and we, so we have basalt lava flows in northern New Jersey. And I'll also point out that we had that basin, right? That basin, which was free to be filled in with more water, more ocean, and large lakes, depositing more of that sediment, that sand, that silt, and that clay. Um, but then, yeah, so this is what I was talking about with um, the igneous rock, right? The Piedmont Plains are defined by water-rich sediment lowlands interrupted by northeast southwest ridges and uplands of erosion resistant stone, such as the south mountain chain formed by the Watch Hill Mountains and South Mountain Reservation. You can see that right here. These are the South Mountain Reservation and Watch Hill Mountain. They're made up of basalt lava flows. This is a picture of Iceland. You can see large lava flows behind me. But within South Mountain Reservation, this is Hemlock Falls, we also have these same columnar basalt formation, just on a much smaller scale here. So if you have a chance, check that out. Um, yeah, and then 18,000 18, years ago, we had glaciers carve just to where we are roughly, but we are actually pretty much at that southern boundary of where glaciers made it. Um, everything below that was glacier three. And so what that means is that we did have some scouring, mostly ending up in the highlands, but then we had what I call moraines. We have glacial till. The, all of that sediment that was broken up by the glaciers got carried further south by meltwater, depositing all this loose, unconsolidated sediment to the south. We also have rivers eroding the landscape and carrying sediment from the high mountains just to the west and north to the Piedmont as well. And Piedmont is the area um, down slope from the mountain is where you get that river in sediment. And so that loose unconsolidated sediment actually allows you to have that marsh. Those marshlands are directly resulting from that loose unconsolidated sediment carried by the rivers, carried by the glaciers, and creates that pore space for all of that water to coalesce. Finally, the coastal plains. The coastal plains is all sand, dark green, that tan and that sort of yellow is all um, new estuarine beach sand deposit. Um, the reason for that is that we had, again, that great large rift basin 
but this time we're actually a bit closer to this larger basin where the ocean was really able to um, take hold. And you can see it here. Um, we have that huge basin of that Jurassic rock and everything above it. And then we have the really new beach tertiary deposits up top. And so this is what the entire, basically south of New Jersey is made up of. Now, some of you might believe, not believe me, you'll say that the entire New Jersey is made up of the Pinelands. And this might be what you envision. You, you are right, we have the Pinelands there. We have all of that soil that's been created. But check this out. This is a clearing within the Pinelands. And an animal started to dig just a few inches and they uncovered some sand right in the heart of the Pinelands. So with that, we've sort of told that story. I definitely am taking longer than I'd like to. We do actually have still um, a lot of information to get through, so I'll try to get through it best I can. Um, so yeah, we've told the story of our four physiographic provinces. The other, I guess, half of what I want to say is about rivers. Um, New Jersey geology and rivers. So we've done the geology, and now we'll do rivers. What is a river, though? Um, on my screen, I have a bunch of different rivers, pictures I've taken from my travels um, around the country and the globe. We've got um, a babbling stream in Costa Rica, a straightaway in Boca Raton in Florida. Um, I believe this is um, the, the sun or in Paris. We've got um, in a river flowing through the through Qualine, China and karst topography behind it. We have this massive waterfall-like area in Iceland. More streams, these are actually in New Jersey, and then a mountainous glacial landscape here. We have huge braided rivers out in New Zealand, where there's just a huge amount of elevation and sediment. Um, obviously, we see nothing like that in New Jersey. And so you guys might be thinking your typical stream is that one narrow uh, stream behind your house, but rivers take all different forms. They have different sediment regimes. They, they, they might be curvy like a snake and cut each other off, creating oxbow lakes. It might be sandy and so filled with mud that it looks like a mud flow. Um, and you might have gravel and boulders throughout. So the, the definition of a river that I'd like to give you is that it's an, really just an area of land that drains the landscape of water. It transports sediment and provides ecosystem services. And what that means is that you can't think of a river just as the one channel or channels where you may find water. It means that you need to think of it as the entire river corridor where you have the, the water, but also the area around it, the floodplain and the underlying hyperheic groundwater zone as well. Um, a few quick things I want to tell you about rivers to make the rest of my talk make more, much more sense is that rivers and their morphology change based on the slope, the um, slope or elevational change, and the amount of sediment that you're giving it. Um, Generally, in our kind of area, as you start in the top with less water and higher slopes, you're going to get a very narrow and deep stream or river. Then as you move downstream, you're going to get a wider and more shallow river. And as well, as you move from the high, deep gradient to the ocean, you'll see rivers go from being more straight and short into becoming larger, more sinuous rivers on the plain. We also will see that in a typical river, especially around here, we have stuff like this happening, where we have um, meander school um, erosion and deposition, where on the outer bank, we get erosion, where the water scours the bank. And then on the inner bank, we have deposition, 
of that sediment. Faster water is scouring, and then on the inside, the water is a bit slower, and it deposited, deposits that sediment. And then in a river, we will also see generally a riffle pool riffle sequence. Riffle, do we have that white water rapid with larger cobbles and boulders? And then pools, where we have really slow moving deep water and silt and sand settling out. Finally, um, within a watershed or a drainage basin, we'll notice that the amount of tributaries or streams we have can be directly impacted by the underlying geology. And what we have here is a simple diagram where we see that um, the upper area of this basin has tons of small little armed tributaries, whereas the bottom has a lot fewer. The top is underlain by silt and clay, rock that's hard to, harder to erode, but you can actually create channels in it. Whereas below, we have carbonate, more porous material, rock that is really easy to erode, um, and means that water, water is more free to move that sediment around. It's not going to get through defined channels. And you'll also get water going below the surface. And so within New Jersey, we have four for geographic provinces and really four um, simplified main New Jersey streams. Mountain brooks, highland streams, coastal, pla coastal plain streams, and tidal streams. Um, very broad simplification, oversimplification, but it does work out. Um, and as you might guess, these brooks or streams directly correlate with our geographic provinces quite nicely. Um, within the highlands, we're going to find our mountain brook, our highlands and highland areas, the valley and ridge province and the highlands, where we have high elevation topographic regimes, we'll find our mountain brook. These are fed by our melting snow and springs and rain. They will generally be clear, nutrient poor and fairly small, but fast flowing due to that steep um, slope. The substrate is usually going to have a lot of rock in the form of boulders, bedrock, boulders, and cobble, right? That, they, that sediment's hard to erode up in the north, and it hasn't had a lot of distance to be eroded either. And then in the steeper features, you'll have step pools and waterfalls. So this is actually Blue Mine Brook, right, by the New Weiss property in Ringwood. Um, both of these are, and you can see the, um, the step waterfall pool happening right here. Then you move into the Piedmont Plains, as well as some of the highlands, but also the coastal plains as well. And here you will have the highland stream. This is going to be, you know, slightly lower elevation, maybe more easily erodible rock. It's going to include bedrock, boulders, cobbles, gravel and, and fine particles. It's still generally a high gradient fast flowing system, but at the lower topography, it can be similar to coastal plain streams. And what you see here are four different um, highland streams. Um, see this one in Rockaway River up in Dover, there's large cobbles, but it's definitely wider than our mountain brook. Here's another one, I've got a video for it. You can see how fast it's moving. You can see the large boulders, this is the riffle area. Um, but it is also wider and it does meet our definition of a highland stream. Then we have these two, Clinton Brook in West Milford and the Passaic River by the Environmental Center. Very different looking than these other two, but they do count as highland streams. This one is definitely starting to look like our coastal plain stream, which I will define for you now. Um, so within the coastal plain physiographic province, we have our coastal plain stream. Flat, low area, gradient stream. The substrate made up more of sand and mud and de decomposing organic matter. That's the rock that we have down there. We have sand. It's also a much flatter area. So the water is moving a lot slower. It's really only going to transport that mud. And so we have lots of swamps and wetlands um, breaking it up as well. 
Then finally, we have the tidal streams. The tidal streams make the very edges of our coastal plains along the, um, the ocean. And these are very similar to the coastal plain stream, but they are so low gradient that sometimes the water actually goes backwards. You have the ocean starting to fill in that river, creating a mixture of fresh water and salt water, which we call brackish water. Very low gradient, um, typically ends in a salt marsh. And you can see right here, um, when the tide is moving out, the water is able to flow downward, but then during a high tide, the ocean actually moved in and overtake that tidal stream. And so those are four rivers of New Jersey, and they are directly a result of the geology that we spoke about. Um, but I do want to sort of drive it home a bit more with sort of a summer where we pulled together the geology and the rivers um, locally, more specific to Parsippany and where we are in North Jersey. So let's do the quick review. What is a watershed? It's an area of land where all the water drains and it's bounded by regional topography. Within New Jersey, we have our 20 watershed management areas. We are located in area six, the Upper Passaic, Whippany, and Rockaway River watershed. And we are located up here, with right on that boundary between the Rockaway and Whippany, and really close to the boundary between the Highlands for Geographic Province and the lower Piedmont plain as well. And you can see that here. That, that dot is not you guys. You guys are actually um, more right here, right below that, um, that lake or reservoir. So you guys are probably right there, right along that boundary, still within the highlands, but also straddling the Rockaway River and the Whippany River watershed. Um, and so, what we see is that with right. So what we see is that within our two geographic provinces in the highlands, we had that marble, that nice the metamorphic rock, which is harder to erode. And in the Piedmont Plain, we have that sedimentary rock, which is easier to erode. But we also had that brown basalt igneous rock creating some of the bridges. This is a really nice um, topographic map that I've already showed you. And we can actually talk about those different observations we made with a bit more knowledge in our mind, right? We have higher elevation up here, the highlands, lower elevation down here, the Piedmont Plain. We know this is made up of the metamorphic rock, harder to erode, whereas this is the easier to erode um, sedimentary rock. To the north, we know that we had glaciers. We had that. To the north, we know that we had the um, tectonic regime where we are um, putting tension to the northwest, southeast, elongating those folds in the northeast, southwest, which created those fractures in that lineation direction, which means that when we had the glaciers come down, they followed the, the path of least resistance, that those fractures in those northeast, southwest trends scouring out those, those um, lakes and creating some of those valleys between the ridges. Um, meanwhile, down to the south, the, gla the, the glaciers really only got to like roughly about here, but we did have some glacial outwash, leaving behind unconsolidated, unconsolidated glacial hill. And what we see is that in the north, our river, our rivers actually follow that northeast southwest trend within the ridges. But then down here, our rivers get a bit more topsy curvy, moving about in kind of random ways within our marshlands, as well as the fact that we have the Great Swamp here. Um, and then I will point out that the upper, the upper Pacific River is pretty straight, but it's bounded by the Watchung Mountains, which we know are our igneous basalt, hard to road and controlling that river. So again, here's another look at our watershed management area. And we'll zoom in a bit more. You can 
again, see some of that um, bridge line and elevational differences, as well as the Great Swamp here. And what I want to point out is that we know how our geology impacts our landscape. I've now just told you that the geology actually impacts our rivers, right? Because the rivers up here in that northeast southwest trend, whereas down here it's a bit more topsy turvy. And we also know that up here we have some of those mountain brook highland streams, whereas down to the south we really just have the highlands and even some coastal plain lake streams. But the other thing I want to point out, um, yes, we can really see the northeast southwest trending and the craziness down to the south. The other thing I want to point out is that the geology controls our rivers and the geology and rivers actually control people. Where we live is a direct result of the geologic history that has come before us. In green, we have our vegetation. In red, we have urbanization and uh, where we live, dense population centers. And what you'll notice is that um, people are much more prevalent within sort of this lower Piedmont flatter area. We do not like to live in steep mountainous areas. And what that means is that we've left behind the forest still. Um, although we do not also, we, don't, we also don't like swamps, so we don't choose to live in the swampy areas either. Um, now, some of you may be looking at this map and say, well, there's still some pretty high density population centers up here. And I will concede that is true. But I will also say that where we have people, those are not our high, steep elevation locations. Those are, again, our values. And you can see that here. Our um, lower elevation areas are exactly where all of those people have chosen to live. But in those really ridgy areas, they do not. Um, and so within our area, we expect highland stream for the most part. Um, we expect it to be including bedrock, boulders, cobble, gravel, fine particles. I mean, expect them to look something like the four streams that we have here, um, kind of varying depending exactly where you look. As I said, these um, classifications were very broad, but they do serve the purpose of giving us a sense. Um, and so I wanted to quickly close, I know we're really close on time, um, by showing you Parsippany, New Jersey. And what I have here, right, this dot is the town hall um, where the environmental commission might meet. And right here, we can actually see Troy River or Troy Brooker Creek. I forget which one it is. Um, we'd expect that to have all the properties of our highland streams. Um, what we might find instead would be very, very different. In fact, if we look at this stream, it looks like doesn't really go anywhere. It just kind of disappears. Um, I know for a fact that Troy Brook actually continues down to the right over here. But due to our urbanization, we've, we've actually completely destroyed the middle of that stream. And right here, I've overlaid a topographic image. You can actually see the contour line of Troy Brook. But when we look at Troy Brook, we actually notice that oddly straight in some ways, and then make some really drastic turns. And when we look at our overview, we can see that it's directly controlled by where we want to have our buildings. Our buildings are directly preventing and controlling where this river goes. And so if we were to get really close to that stream, we probably see, I've never been there, maybe some of you have, but what I would imagine we'd see are some ripples, some cobbles, but very, very little riparian buffer. I do see some forest around it, um, but I'd also imagine that the area has been largely scoured out and it's very straight. Remember how I said that in the bends we would get the um, 
on the outer bound, we get the erosion, and on the inner bound, we, we get that deprivation. This stream does not have the land to move to create that erosion on the outside and deposition on the inside. So that would mean that the stream would be moving into our suburbia. And so that means we have completely walled it in and blocked it to there. Now, this is actually a little bit of a different um, scenario. This is the Troy Meadows wetland. We also have the Troy Brook moving through. Um, in general, I would not necessarily expect this to look like our highland stream. Um, I'd maybe you think it would look more like our coastal plain. We have our marshy areas. We know we have marsh due to the deposition of our glacial outwash plain and unconsolidated sediment and sandstone below. And this is what we've left of it. But when I look at Troy Brook um, to the west, it looks really it looks like it's kind of curving around. And even if we are controlling it, we're letting it still do its curvy thing. Um, but as we move into the Meadowlands, it gets way, way straight. This is just a straight line. I could put a ruler to that. And again, I've never been there. Maybe one of you have, and you could tell me what's going on. Um, but that just looks completely wacky and wrong to me. Um, rivers should be moving around. Now, within the wetlands, we the do expect thing is, yeah, um, swampy. It's it's all swamp. There's there's those are fake lines. It's just completely uh, wet all the way through. No, right. not yeah. So or anything within the wetlands, we do expect a lot of randomness. Um, but the fact that this one thing is we is like that just tells me that we had impact with this in some way, shape, or form. And as we look at it, we can see that wet line that you were talking about going all the way through, we zoom in, and it's really just, you know, straight cutting through there. Um, just sort of that caught my eye, and I thought I'd share with you. Um, so what's going on here is we have something called urban stream syndrome. We take those pristine classic books that I told you about, and we, channelize them. We decrease the complexity, we increase the amount of flooding and energy, and around the stream to remove that buffer, we increase that impervious surface, which allows for more water to rush in and those pollutants to be carried. And then again, yes, the reduced riparian buffer zone. And if you think about my definition of a river, it's something that drains the landscape we're still allowing it to drain the landscape, but it also is supposed to transport sediment. If we're cutting off the river from the landscape around it, we've completely removed its ability to do that and completely upset the way the rivers work, leading to more flooding and an unhealthy stream. And then we've also reduced the buffer, the vegetation around it, meaning that we've completely cut it off from its ecosystem services that it's supposed to provide. So in a sense, we've taken our rivers and we've made them into pipes. And so my, my final thought, we are truly really quite almost done with this presentation, is that when I speak to you guys about a river and I say unhealthy versus healthy, I think we'll all agree that this, an image of this might pop into our mind behind our local shopping strip mall. And this would be an extremely unhealthy, heavily polluted stream, obviously with no control left from our geologic regime. We don't see any of those rocks or boulders or anything really playing a role at all. And when I say to you now envision a healthy stream, what I guess many of you might think is you think of something like this sitting in your park on the bank of a stream. The stream looks healthy, it's meandering a little bit. You've got your trees in the distance and maybe even some vegetation growing on the bank. But I'd like to challenge your perspective and go one step further. This image of a healthy stream is a very human suburban 
idea of a healthy exchange. What I see when I look at this is a completely clear cut landscape, a landscape where we have a lawn, grass. We've destroyed the riparian buffer of the area. And because we want to have a bench here, we may have even walled in some of that stream still because we don't want the stream to flood our park or move around out of the park. With, so with that, I'd like to propose that this is what a truly healthy full stream might look like. We've got our forest growing around, doing exactly what it wants. We have our ripples with our large different sediment boulder cobble combinations throughout. And we even have our cut banks where we're eroding that out, the outside bend and depositing it on the island here, allowing our river to move back and forth across the landscape, transport that water, transport that sediment, and provide ecosystem services to the landscape around it. And so what can we do about our river? Well, we can keep this ideal in mind and make our construction more friendly to um, that kind of regime, but we can also volunteer, right? I am a New Jersey watershed ambassador. I put on all sorts of different programs and events for cleanup, for tree planting, um, green infrastructure, anything that would address the multitude of issues that I just discussed and would help us kind of start to restore our rivers to the natural rivers that we would expect to see in New Jersey due to the geologic regime that developed the landscape we have today. Um, these are just some of the tools that I use throughout if you're interested in playing with them. Um, they're really awesome. Always happy to talk about those more if you have any questions. So with that, I say thank you. Um, have the contact information on the bottom. I know we did go eight minutes over time or so, but if we have time, I'm happy to take questions as well. Yeah, absolutely. Brian, that was great. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, and anyway, if, feel free to unmute yourself if you have any questions or even if you have any comments, um, you know, uh, um, Paul said, great presentation. Thanks so much, Brian. Thank you, Paul. Happy to be here and talk to you. So I don't know. Um, and Lynn said, Lynn and Cheryl said, thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Looks like nobody... Judy might have a question. I, yep. I have a question. Of course you do. I have a <laughs> I have a couple of questions. Well, one, one, I'm going back to the geology portion of this because when you were talking about the Pangaea and how it's separate, how we separated. So can we, can we find evidence of those connections, like, yes, from we, Africa to here? Yeah, we we absolutely do find that, and that is a large part of the geologic evidence we have that Pangaea was a thing. We find that's really um, the cool. same rock. It's amazing. It really is yeah. amazing. Wow. That's wonderful. Um, and then Lynn has a question. What are the blue holes in the Pinelands? Blue, I, I don't I'm know not what. I'm quite sure what you're talking about. I'm sorry. Can you give me more information, Lynn? What are the blue holes in the Pinelands? I think he's, he'll probably type something in there. Um, let's give him a second. Uh, maybe to refer, maybe you could reference a slide or something, Lynn. Nope. I think he's still there. Yeah, he's still there. But, um, you could unmute. Can you unmute yourself, Lynn? Let me see if I can do this. I know he was having problems. Hold on. Um, he hasn't said anything, but um, uh, Banu said, thank you very much, Brian. Very nice presentation. 
Um, Lynn said, apparently there are clear blue holes of water. Are they sinkholes or limestone? Um, and the pine lens, I guess. So I'm, I'm not entirely sure what you're talking about. Um, what I will note is that much of the pine lens are also part marshland. Um, so we do have some areas where there's a ton of water um, fell in the landscape. And we, we do have some limestone, uh, specifically, you know, near Trenton. Trenton is underlain by limestone by limestone, to by the water, it was notoriously hard in that area. Um, beyond that, I'm sorry, I'm not entirely sure what you may be referencing. Did that, did that answer? If it didn't answer your question, Lynn, you can always email me and then I can email Brian if you, you know, if you, if that didn't answer your question. Uh, thank you. I think Great. that was it, is what he said. Thank you. I think that was it. Um, Glad I could answer your question. He said he thinks that was it, but I'm sure that if he, at any point, he knows he can email me and then I can email you if there's, if, if, if you know, it get, becomes a different question along the way. Um, so do we have any other questions? Um, if not, ah, there we go, Miss Judy. You have to unmute yourself. Okay, one more is, um, on for the title streams, um, how do you, see climate change affecting that whole interaction on our coasts. Right. So I don't know if that's a fair question. So <laughs> that's a big that question. Has, um two things I want to say about that. One, New Jersey was glaciated, right? The entire northern United States had glaciers on it. Glaciers can be mild thick. They are really, really, really heavy. So if we go back to what I was talking about with the plate tectonics, we have that crust on top of our jelly. Now imagine we have that crust, but we add huge amounts of weight on top. The jelly is going to start to sink up top and maybe rise a little bit further down south where we don't have that extra weight, right? Almost like a, a seesaw push in northern North America, northern North America, and we can rise a bit in a bit further south. So glaciers came along the eastern seaboard down to the top of New Jersey, pushed down up there, and pushed the jelly up in South Jersey. Now, the last glaciers were 20,000 years ago. We're talking on geologic time scales. Things move really slowly. The north is actually still rebounding. We call that isostatic rebound. The rock is actually still rebounding. And the rock down south is still sinking. It's still e equilibrating. And what that means is that not only during climate change, so during climate change, we have rising sea level globally um, at different rates globally due to um, gravitational pull, where the water is melting, et cetera. Um, but along the eastern seaboard of the United States, and really the, I believe the globe, the sea level is rising the fastest on New Jersey coast out of anywhere in the entire globe. And that's because not only do we have the water rising, we also have the land sinking due to the reversing effect of the isostatic rebound. Great. Now I now I really won't sleep anymore. <laughs> Thank you. That makes two Great of us. presentation. What was your other question? Oh, I did I, have I forget, another I forget, one. I, forget, I, I, I just want to say I forget if it was you know the entire country or the entire globe, but it was. I know. I know we're called Ground Zero though for climate change, and and yeah. that's something that we really need to educate. Um, people on and what we're trying to address here in New Jersey, like what can we do in, in, in Port Sippany, I mean, to cut down on fossil fuels. But um, I'd like to talk to you offline a little bit and I'll get in touch with you as your, our ambassador on some green infrastructure ideas for the Troy Book area. Okay. It's something that's way overdue. 
So I thank you. It was a great presentation. And if anybody else is on on here who wants to, uh, you know, volunteer, like Brian asked, Parsippany is looking for help. So yeah, let me. I'm gonna. I did. I did want to tell you. Brian. I didn't want to pull up a different um, screen. I just wanted um, to tell you that uh, Katie and Angie said thank you, Brian, and Paul said that's bad news for the Jersey Shore. I know. Yeah, I know it's bad news for the Jersey. I like show. Paul's background so, too. <laughs> share my screen real quick again. Don't stop recording yet. I'm not going um, to. Right here. This screen, what I have here are two links. If you're interested in learning more about the New Jersey Watershed Ambassador Program and the other ambassadors around the state, go to that first link or just type in NJWAP into Google. Um, and if you want to look at the different events that ambassadors are running around the state, check out our Facebook page. Every public cleanup tree planting event that we're running is posted on that Facebook page. Stuff is happening statewide. And what I'll also do is I will um, copy and paste that into onto our Facebook page uh, when I That's when awesome. I post this recording. I'll, I'll, I'll do that also, so people can look at it then. Okay. Well, that, I think that was terrific, thank you. Brian. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Um, Are you doing watching, another one? Yeah, I'm doing one more presentation. I've got- Earth Day Non-Points. Non-Point Source Pollution and Bioscape Model. Excellent. Um, good for the whole family, bring your kid, bring your friend. <laughs> okay. Um, It'll be okay. a big model, very interactive. All right. And it'll be a bunch that of That is a fun model. Okay. Too bad we're not in person, right? Okay. okay. Thank you so much. And thank you, Jean um, Marie Ambler, for, for hosting. You're welcome. And for everybody who, and, who came. Yep. I'm really happy so many people came. All right, then. Okay. We will see you um, uh, on the next meeting. And um, if any of you, are interested in coming to some more green team programs through the Parsippany Library, you can go on to parsippanylibrary.org um, and look at the calendar and sign up. Like us on Facebook, Parsippany Green Team. We have a Facebook page. So. <laughs> All righty, guys. Fun. Good night, everyone. <laughs> no, sorry. Thank you, Brian. Shameless. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone.